Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. Ray Thank Sumner you. is a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology and Geography at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. He researches the early Indian Wars, 1862 to 69, in the United States. He holds two MAs in history, one from Colorado State University with a concentration in public history, and the second from the American Military University where his thesis was on the expeditions of Major John Wesley Powell to the West in 1867 to 70. Additionally, he is a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel with 22 years of service, 16 of which were overseas. He was stationed in and deployed to Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, and Thailand. Welcome, Ray. Thank you. Let's see if I can share this. And everyone see the slides now that I can't see you. I cannot Brittany, can see them. See the yeah, not yet. Now it's starting up. Okay, are we good to go now? Perfect. All right, well, thank you for having me. My, uh, you said I'm Ray Sumner. Uh, I work in the, uh, with doc, under Dr. Jason Bell, the Center for Mountain Plains Archaeology in the Department of uh, Anthropology and Geography, as we've added them last year, uh, as full members of the department, and we'll soon start probably even having graduate programs in geography. Uh, so today I'm here to talk about my dissertation research. I'm uh, in my third year of my PhD, and I'm uh, just uh, in uh, December, did my uh, proposal defense. And so fortunately, starting the semester, I'm ABD, uh, and after I finish my dissertation credits, uh, we'll spend the next probably year and a half to two years uh, focused on research and writing. Uh, I've been exploring uh, for the past two years, really, the topic, two and a half years of uh, of the uh, what I call the Julesburg campaign, and I'll talk about that throughout the presentation. And so this uh, uh, presentation really gives you a little bit of the history of, of the conflict, uh, being a historical archaeologist, and then dives into kind of what uh, initial research I've done, and we'll forecast where I plan to go uh, with the research. Uh, with that said, a quick overview of it. And so really when you, and I, as I've used in the title, and I started using this a couple of years ago in a, in a three minute challenge, I guess, when I uh, had an epiphany to use that title of the Colorado Park Day. Uh, so really if I ask most people in Colorado, one of the days in Colorado history uh, that they comes to mind when you ask a dark day, obviously Sand Creek, if not top of that list is among the one or two uh, events people would uh, highlight from Colorado's territorial and uh, state days is a dark day. Obviously, uh, some of the uh, unrest in the early 1900s uh, during the uh, mining era come to mind as well with the Ludlow massacre, but uh, definitely on the top of that list. And here at Sand Creek, you obviously uh, have a, on the quote from the National uh, Park Service Sand Creek website, that kind of highlights how they reflected the, uh, uh, on Sand Creek. And there's been a lot of uh, work done on Sand Creek. So really when my research, I use this as starting the day after and looking at what happened. Um, there hasn't been a great deal of academic uh, archaeologists or historians look at that at the time period afterward. And so that's really a space uh, that I hope to uh, fill. Uh, so what's missing, and from a, especially from an archaeological context, is really a forgotten period. I saw Jeff Broom on, on Really, Jeff and only a few other people uh, that have taken on looking at this time period of the Indian Wars. And uh, as I said, uh, professional archaeologists uh, barely know where eastern Colorado is. Uh, there's not a lot of Section 106 that drives CRM work in the area. And so uh, really hoping to fill that gap and dig in to that. But it's not just a problem within the academic community of going out and uh, doing archaeology in there. It's, it's also an area and a time period uh, that was really overlooked or kept quiet within even the uh, various Native American tribes. Uh, shown on the slide is uh, John Stanson Timber, who was born in the early 1880s and is a Northern Cheyenne and became their noted tribal historian, a role taken over after the adopted member of the Northern Cheyenne tribe by Father Peter Powell, 
that he said even to him within the tribe, the original members that participated in the campaign around Julesburg would not talk about the events that occurred in early 1865. Uh, and he never to their last days was able to break that wall uh, down. So really looking in and trying to piece together what happened uh, from both the military side of the United States, as well as through the various Native American uh, tribes that were involved is a goal uh, for this. Uh, if you go to Sand Creek today, you'll see a lot of uh, discussion about what happened to the Cheyenne Arapaho uh, decades later, the battles they were involved in. Uh, but there's really even there no mention of the immediacy of what happens uh, at the actual monument itself. On the website, you find a few minor mentions of it. But again, you find even much more discussion of events later in 1865 uh, than you do what happened there. And even most recently, the overlook kind of really continues. On the far right of this slide, it shows a study that was completed and delivered to Congress in the beginning of uh, the pandemic in 20, right before the pandemic last year, uh, that looked at expansions to the national trail system. And because there's so little uh, information within the archaeological community, and uh, there's very little published outside of the, the few works uh, that have been done on it, uh, in the past decade or so that the contractors that wrote this report actually didn't recommend the inclusion of the Denver Road, what they called the Central Emigrant Route through Colorado up through Livermore to the National Trails system because they basically argued there wasn't uh, the merit for it and that there wasn't a lot of history that needed to be documented or displayed uh, that couldn't be found elsewhere. And as I go through this, I really think the overlook of Julesburg is substantial because it far, plays a far greater role in our in the Indian War history than it's previously been given credit to. And really uh, looking at that, if you look at a map here and kind of gives you that glimpse of how it's uh, overlooked, it shows the different uh, historical sites of the Indian War period. Uh, the upper in yellow being the National Park Service sites, green or active duty military installations still uh, that remain from the Indian War. The orange are state historical uh, facilities, uh, and then the pink are locally managed sites. And so when you look at the uh, Battle of Julesburg and the campaign along the uh, Denver Road or the Overland Trail, depending on what people want to refer to it as, uh, almost no uh, recognition of that uh, beyond the local level. The only one that even has a museum on the site is the Battle of Beecher Island. There are museums near, near the battle of Julesburg and the Battle of Summit Springs and the, the cities nearby of Julesburg and Sterling, but there's nothing uh, official on the sites other than markers that designate the event that happened uh, there. So it kind of shows you graphically here uh, the overlook. I think it's also interesting showing you the trails, uh, which are highlighted, the different portions of the National Historic Trail System and how the role that Colorado played in that yet, uh, as currently it's really overlooked in the trail system. So hopefully what I plan to add to the conversation uh, through my research here is on the slide. I, I approach this as we'll talk more from the viewpoint of a former military officer that spent about 16 years at, at a theater level planning uh, campaigns for all of the Korean Peninsula and other places in the Pacific. Uh, so I hope to use a multi-scalar, multi-temporal and multidisciplinary approach in my research uh, to look at the Native American actions much more as a series of planned events within the larger historic themes and trends. Um, you'll generally hear in a lot of times that what happened during this time period were series of raids or simply revenges, uh, that they were just attacking every settler that they could find. Well, I'm sure there's a great deal of revenge in their motivation. Uh, as we'll talk later on, there's also a lot of actual military uh, specificity in the type of operations they're doing and the decisions about attacking what location at what time uh, they do that. And we'll talk that a little more uh, through. As I said, I approached this through a uh, military framework. And this was a slide I developed for my thesis uh, defense and talked about different approaches. Uh, initially, I had a lot more grandiose designs. Uh, my committees helped me narrow that focus down to make it a little more succinct on the military theories that I uh, plan to uh, address directly in my analysis and doing my dissertation. The, the primary one that has the star in the upper left is the levels of war analysis. 
And, and that's where you look at the operations from both the all the belligerent parties, and by that I simply mean the military forces involved uh, at the strategic, operational, and tactical level, as well in incorporating in that looking at the, the other entities that were in the battle space adjacent to those uh, levels. So looking at the, the Native American tribes that chose not to be involved or help the U.S. military, as well as the civilians uh, political infrastructure and, and uh, commercial infrastructure that was in that region, in the areas of uh, study. Uh, moving down below that, I plan to use a dime analysis at the strategic and operational level, uh, which is a diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, looking at how the sides use their collective national level or tribal level elements of power, what they could do to influence uh at that level and the strategic goals. At the uh, PAMISI, which gives you the acronym below what the stands for, uh, that really looks at more that infrastructure of all those different things, the different nodes and how different sites were chosen to be targets and others were not, why they chose, especially on the Native American side, uh, to select Julesburg as the center of their attention in 1865. It really bookmarks the campaign in Colorado uh, they attack it on January 7th, leave it in relative tact. It's resupplied, and then they come back again on February 2nd, knowing they're going to go north and actually then burn the town. Um, on the far right, the intelligence preparation of the battlefield is a is how the military would look at designing a divisional or a brigade operation or even a battalion. And to replicate that process, to really understand the decisions that were made of how the Regimental commanders in Colorado and Western Nebraska primarily uh, were making their decisions about to array their troops. And then I'll use what is called in the National Park Service mandates for a battlefield analysis in their doctrine. It's modified off a military construct of Kakoa, where at the small unit level, you look at the terrain, observation, cover and concealment obstacles and avenues of approach uh, to understand how and why tactical commanders made the decisions that they did on a specific area of ground at a specific time against a, a specific enemy and to try to recreate some of those decisions and on both sides and understand the tactics uh, that they applied. Uh, my overall thesis again is uh, to kind of art is to argue that the conflict between the U.S. Army and the Cheyenne, the Arapaho and the Lakota is really a viewed as a series of related offensive operations and defensive actions conducted in the aftermath and in response to the Sand Creek Massacre and not an unrelated independent actions by the U.S. Army, the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota. Um, as I said, my primary construct through doing that is laying out that the levels of war analysis. On the right-hand side of the slide, it kind of shows you some of the uh, products I plan to, plan to produce through my dissertation research. And then on, when you under each on the left, it kind of outlines the different uh, methodological approaches uh, so I can complete this in two to three years and not 30 years. At the strategic level, it'll primarily be a historical record review uh, of the primary and some of the secondary sources. At the operational level, I'll primarily look at physical geography and spatial analysis uh, as the methodology. Uh, the tactical level is where I'll really turn to much more the uh, archaeological and ethnographic historical record, uh, and then at the very lower levels of the tactical, looking at the specific actions on the battlefield uh, is where the field work in archaeology really will take place and will be a major focus of my uh, research activities. Uh, my overall thesis, uh, again, is there, but then it kind of shows each of those strategic operational and tactical levels, the tactical being split into two has two spe has uh, specific research questions uh, associated with it, with it uh, that'll guide the methodologies and uh, techniques I apply, uh, especially on the archeological side uh, in conducting research. And we'll talk these as we go through in the coming slides in a little more depth. Uh, turning to the strategic and trying to explain that a little more, uh, really in looking at the historical setting and understand why the army is doing what it is doing in the West uh, will really uh, be to continue to look at the how the Army was organized for the United States. And you really have a series of uh, different uh, military departments that all work for Washington. Uh, you have five that are focused on armed rebellion dealing with the South. 
uh, fighting the Confederate Army. Uh, you have three that are involved with border areas that have civilian insurgencies. Uh, so their commanders are focused on those actions. Uh, then you have a seven or so departments that are focused on sustainment. These are the ones that really have no major conflict within their borders, uh, with a little bit, obviously, in Pennsylvania for a small amount of time, uh, but are primarily focused on providing the troops, supplies, and uh, material that is needed to fight the war. And then you have the West, uh, with focus of my research, where you have six departments that are pieces or por por portions of departments that are focused really on what we now call stability operations. They're given minimal forces and are just there to maintain whatever they can so it doesn't become a distractor from the primary goals of the government and the U.S. military in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, on the uncovering the Native American goals, obviously it's much more difficult for the uh, U.S. military. There isn't a, a multi-hundred uh, books of records that have been put together in the late 19th century that capture from the smallest tactical unit report all the way up to telegrams and messages between President Lincoln and his generals, what was going on in the uh, Union as well as the Confederate Army uh, that you can be relied upon. So recreating what was going on in the Native American front uh, is much more challenging uh, because that is obviously not as well documented. Uh, and when it is, you have to question some of the sources. Uh, so really trying to reconstruct the movement of the Native American uh, tribes and bands that were involved uh, throughout this period, looking at the winter counts that are available, a lot of the early action uh, that came through, and really trying to dig in beyond just the original treaty of Fort Laramie map, uh, which personally, a lot of times, uh, that treaty in 1851 is kind of how we determine, and even today for the U.S. government, a lot of times, view and refer to the Native American treaty lands as what they had originally during the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851. So to hopefully develop a much more interactive understanding of the movement of the Native American tribes that can present that through ArcGIS and some other layers uh, to provide a, a much more visual way to engage that information of the movement of the different elements uh, of the Plains Indian tribes uh, across the plains in the 1840s and 50s, uh, especially. Uh, on the operational level of war, uh, it's really the contested plains uh, where I'm focused on, uh, which is for the time period of my study is the uh, Department of Kansas was originally the organization. It goes away uh, in a couple of iterations through the early part of 1865. Uh, to the end of the Civil War. Uh, but on December 31st, 1865, this is how it looked. Uh, Major General Curtis, a former Iowa congressman, is the commander based out of Fort Leavenworth. Uh, he has a number of districts within his command. Uh, the key to that is the District of Nebraska, uh, which is split basically around uh, Fort Kearney uh, area is commanded by the commander of the 7th Iowa and the Eastern District of Nebraska. The Western District of Nebraska is commanded by Colonel Collins, who Fort Collins is actually named after. Uh, he orders the post to originally be established, uh, thus the name. His son is Casper Collins, who was killed at the Battle of Platte River Bridge Station in 1865, and thus the name of Casper uh, traces to his son uh, is name. Other important district, of course, for this battle is the District of Colorado, uh, which does not include Julesburg. That is given to the 7th Iowa at the time, there was actually debate about where Julesburg uh, was located, if it was in Colorado or if it was in Nebraska. There was a continual argument uh, which wasn't uh, resolved until 1873-74 when the Wheeler survey came in and put a marker uh, right along the Transcontinental Railroad. And after a summer of uh, latitude longitudinal studies, was able to determine Julesburg was, in fact, in Colorado. So we uh, have them to thank for that. Uh, but when you're looking at this map, you'll see that Julesburg is really in a center where you see none of the little uh, flags, circular flag and teepee, or uh, flagpoles and uh, tents showing uh, that Julesburg is in an area that is not well supported by any other camp. It's probably the most isolated post along any of the trails uh, throughout uh, Nebraska, Colorado, or uh, Kansas. 
And so again, if you're at Sand Creek, about 100 miles south of Julesburg, and you want to have a retribution, uh, Julesburg becomes a very logical uh, spot uh, to uh, attack. And so in my work at the operational level, we do a lot more analysis of why it was so isolated, why the military chose that, uh, and then uh, transversely, why the Native Americans with their understanding, uh, their trails and routes that they would use, uh, again, why it made perfect sense uh, that that isolated post would be chosen as the scene of the battle. On the operational side, as I said, the commanders of the military are much easier to understand. Uh, I show both Colonel Shivington, uh, who led the, uh, the massacre at Sand Creek. He was uh, resigned in late December, was replaced by Colonel Moonlight of uh, Kansas uh, in 1865. And uh, as the district commander in Colorado, I do like to highlight that uh, because a lot of times we blame this solely on the Colorado militia uh, with the third Colorado and others being involved. But it needs to be noted that Colonel Shivington, while a militia uh, member of the first Colorado originally, uh, is the district commander for the district of Colorado, which is a United States Army sub district or district command of the United States Army's military structure. So when he does that action, he is the senior military commander for the U.S. Army in Colorado. He is not simply a commander of a unit that went out and committed an atrocity, uh, which I think sometimes my former employer uh, likes to allow people to make that relegation. Um, yet the other commanders there that are the commanders around uh, the district of, uh, excuse me, the Department of Kansas, General Solly is conducting operations in what are now the Dakotas, uh, based out of Iowa, as his uh, home uh, department is based. And then you had uh, General Connor, uh, who was the uh, district uh, commander for Utah, out of the Department of Pacific, who plays an interesting role in how uh, the events unfold in 1864 as well as 1865. Unfortunately, on the Native American side, it's much harder to determine uh, exactly who was involved. The senior leaders are a little more easy to identify. Fortunately, uh, if you're familiar with Ben's Fort, uh, William Ben's son, who was half Northern, uh, half Southern Cheyenne, I have a mistake on my slide there, uh, was a member of the uh, of the Cheyenne Southern Cheyenne tribe. He was actually at Black Kettle's village with his mother's family. Uh, when the Sand Creek Massacre occurred, uh, he was saved by members of the Mexico militia uh, that were with the, the forces that attacked uh, Sand Creek, that recognized him and knew that he was uh, Colonel Ben's son, and thus spared him and his uh, half-brother uh, and his uh, from being, uh, and his brother and future brother-in-law, excuse me, uh, from being uh, executed. Most of the leaders we know involved uh, come through his work. Uh, with George Hyde later in life in the early 19th century, uh, excuse me, in the early 1900s and the 20th century, when he outlined his recollections of the events. Uh, he went along and fought with the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho and Lakota throughout most of 1865, and so provided a great insight uh, into that, having the ability uh, to speak in both English and obviously his native and Cheyenne, which was as well one of his native languages. We do know that Spotted Tell, who uh, eventually became one of the primary chiefs of the Lakotas on the Red Cloud and then later the Brule uh, reservations in South Dakota was there. Black Kettle was around the events, uh, but left after uh, the first battle of Julesburg and had headed south before they returned uh, with their loot from the uh, first attacks. Reports are that Pawnee Keller, a noted Ogallala, Lakota band leader was present uh, as one of the uh, really wartime leaders. Little Thunder would have been the head of the Sinkangu Lakota at the time. Uh, Spotted Tail later, uh, within a few years, had displaced him. Um, and then we also know that there were other uh, Native American leaders may have been involved. We're fairly confident Red Cloud was still uh, north of Fort Laramie uh, with the often referred to Laramie Loafer Band and others. Uh, near the Powder River country. Uh, Roman knows he was a dog soldier leader who was killed at Beecher Island in 1866, uh, would have been present. Tall Bull is noted to have been present, was another member with the dog soldiers when he was killed at Summit Springs uh, a few years later. Uh, Crazy Horse, 
uh, who is Spotted Tail's nephew, comes down and is present for the second battle of Little Big, uh, the second battle of Julesburg, of course, prominent roles in many other battles, most notably the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Uh, Sitting Bull does not come down all the way to uh, Julesburg, uh, but later in 1865, as the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota attempt to make it a larger campaign, uh, he does become involved in actions in South Dakota that are attacks on Fort Pierce that are trying to be conducted in concert with events uh, at that time then later on in Wyoming around uh, the Platte River Bridge and some other attacks. Uh, another noted one, Little Wolf, who is uh, at the Battle of Little Bighorn involved in the Cheyenne Exodus. Uh, we don't believe made his way down all the way to Julesburg in time, uh, but then did become very active in the activities post the Julesburg attacks, uh, which I will argue in my uh, is really the entire 1865 period post Julesburg from the Native Americans perspective is really the same series uh, of connected events that are all trickling back as a reaction to the initial massacre uh, at Sand Creek. Um, one of the complexities, as I've kind of just highlighted on this, uh, with the looking at the uh, operational level of war is all the events taking place uh, throughout 1864 and 1865, uh, really to look at it operationally, General Curtis is looking at events from about a 24 month time period as he tries to move pieces around and recreating all of that and looking at it is a difficult undertaking. Uh, so hopefully uh, I'll be successful in, in writing that and trying to understand better why we get to the events uh, that we do in 1865. Uh, and I noted on here some of the green uh, that I'll contact. General Connors plays a very interesting role, uh, which I think has really been even underlooked, overlooked, excuse me, in uh, understanding Sand Creek. And that's in October of 1864. Connor is ordered by General Halleck in D.C. to come and basically take over the Overland Trail. In the aftermath of the uh, events in 1864, uh, primarily in Nebraska, but some here in Colorado and other spots in Kansas, uh, they're very concerned about the Overland Trail being shut down again, cutting off Denver and Salt Lake, having to ship the mail back around uh, by sea and across the Isthmus of Panama, back to San Francisco to come to Salt Lake. Uh, and so he's ordered to come make an assessment. He's supposed to bring two cavalry troops with him from Salt Lake. They get stuck at Fort Bridger uh, because of snow, but he does arrive in, in November uh, just weeks before Shivington leaves to conduct the Sand Creek Massacre to conduct a survey so that he can come over and take charge of the Overland Trail, basically showing uh, Shivington that he's incompetent uh, because the Santa Fe Trail has already been taken away and now Halleck is going to take away the other ma major aspect of Shivington's district uh, from him and the commanders in Colorado. Uh, key events about Connor to look at that as I just talked some of those uh, when he comes and does this. Uh, you'll see the, the drill down dates and how they relate to the Sand Creek Massacre. Uh, so he literally sends right days before Shivington departs to, uh, Denver to head back to uh, Salt Lake City on the Overland stage. He's been going across the route with uh, Holiday that owns the stage uh, company and has uh, deep ties to Washington. Uh, so Connor sends back this report to Halleck. And in the report, as you'll see highlighted in red, he talks about how he thinks they, they need to have an expedition against the Native Americans, basically to teach him a lesson. Connor had been involved in one of the massacres of a year earlier uh, in Utah, and what is now Idaho, uh, on the Utah-Idaho border. And uh, so he has no qualms about conducting that type of operation. He just doesn't think the forces exist in the area to conduct it. And so then he offers the advice that uh, he does not deem it wise or prudent, either to undertake or advise a campaign against them at this time. Uh, so basically, he's telling General Halleck, uh, if he were to do what Shivington does, he will unleash the wrath of the Native Americans on the plains and the military that's in place has absolutely no capability to respond and control the reaction. Uh, of course, history records that Shivington did not heed his advice. Uh, and that Shivington then days afterwards, eight days, uh, conducts the Sand Creek Massacre. Uh, turning more to the tactical level to the Julesburg campaign, on the upper level, uh, 
and what really happens again to look at where Julesburg is on the map and it talks some of the distances on that upper yellow box. Uh, the commander who was a captain at Julesburg at Camp Rankin at the time really finds himself isolated. His nearest uh, reinforcement, uh, other than a few uh, squads of soldiers that are located at ranches to the east and west of him, are uh, are at Camp Cottonwood, uh, which is where a good chunk of the 7th Iowa was located. It's a good 135 miles away. Uh, even for cavalry soldiers coming, it's a good two-plus day ride. Uh, they would be fairly well exhausted responding. Uh, Camp Weld, who had uh, maybe a company more soldiers not engaged in already protecting the trail at that time, was 190 miles away, a good three days ride. Uh, Fort Laramie, where you had another grouping of soldiers, a couple uh, companies that can respond to events in uh, Wyoming and western Nebraska, was another 135, two to three day ride away. So again, Julesburg finds itself sitting there with these massive warehouses for the Overland Stage Company, at least massive at the time, uh, with nowhere but a small detachment of the 7th Iowa. Uh, one company, which on the time of the attack, numbered about 50 soldiers uh, that was able to respond uh, to any trouble at Julesburg. On the Native American side, we really know very few, as I mentioned, the tactical leaders. The one that Bent highlights uh, as a being selected to carry out some of the deception operations uh, is a chief known as Big uh, Big Crow. He was the chief of one of the warrior societies of the Southern Cheyenne, the Crooked Lance Society. And we'll talk his uh, deception plan and try his ruse to try to engage the soldiers uh, shortly. So what happens uh, to look at the battle, and one thing I've really spent most of the last two years trying to understand are the events of this period. Uh, Jeff Broom's book, uh, The Cheyenne War, has been essential to that. Uh, there are a few other local historians uh, there are a few local historians who have written on it from Eastern Colorado, uh, Dallas Williams and Doris Monahan uh, over the last uh, last 30 years have wrote a few books on it that have been very helpful as well. Uh, but until Jeff's book, really nobody even looked at this period collectively uh, in Colorado in a, in a great depth of trying to look at how the events between not just 1865, but how they related to 1864. 68, 69, all the way uh, to the Battle of Summit Springs, uh, which is an essential piece of understanding uh, because, again, I think a lot of times we think of these just as isolated events, uh, and there's probably a lot more to what's going on uh, than has past been looked at uh, prior to Jeff's work. Whoops, I hit my slide there. As we go, then after they uh, come and attack, and I'll attack the attack on Julesburg in a little more detail. They attack Julesburg, but again, to really look why this is a campaign, uh, they do that from uh, near St. Francis, uh, Nebraska, just south of the Nebraska, uh, Kansas, Colorado border. Uh, from there, they come up and then attack in three waves for a period of about uh, five weeks uh, along the Denver Road, all the way from almost to Fort Morgan uh, and into Nebraska to Alkali Station and other areas. Uh, you have raids on wagon trains and stage stations. Uh, and they break this up based on the terrain that people are most likely to understand. The Cheyenne, especially the Southern Cheyenne, knew the Western area uh, in Colorado much better. The Arapaho had the least knowledge of the area, took the center, uh, which was a little more understood to them. And then the uh, Lakota bands took mostly to the, the east of Julesburg areas, especially with the Sinkangu that they were much more familiar with as their traditional uh, hunting grounds. The week after Julesburg, they attack a series of ranches uh, between Fort Morgan and Sterling that existed uh, on those. Uh, during that time period, they attack and burn those ranches. The only ranch that survives was, at the time, Godfrey's Ranch, which out of this battle becomes known as Fort Wicked. Uh, the week following that, they move closer into Julesburg again. And at this time, they're still heading back towards St. Francis and to other campsites uh, well south of the Platte, South Platte River. They again attack all of these stations, burning the vast majority of them. Uh, very few of those survive again. Uh, Valley Station, which did have some soldiers stationed at it uh, from the under the District of Colorado, a company minus, is there. They, they're able to fend off enough of the uh, Native American attacks to uh, save Valley Station, which is just north of Sterling. 
And then they come back again uh, just before the third week after the Julesburg attack, and they attack along the uh, ranches and stage stations just to the uh, west of Julesburg uh, near the Logan uh, Sedgwick County line where the Jumbo Reservoir is today. And again, during this, uh, they're very successful in burning nearly every single ranch uh, and stage station, running off the stock, destroying or taking the stores if they're able to. Uh, from this and basically laying waste uh, to that entire section of over 100 miles of the uh, Denver Road. 29th, uh, they come back and attack just four miles, excuse me, eight miles east of Julesburg uh, at the Gillette Ranch. Uh, there, there's another ranch closer that they also attack and then continue their activities uh, moving to the east in that same time period into Nebraska, running off stock and attacking wagon trains harassing the military at Alkali Station at the end of January. And then they uh, decide to, uh, one thing, I sorry, I overstepped. Uh, they also move up on the 28th at that time period when they're attacking west of Julesburg. Uh, they come up and attack. They move their village from Kansas and the other areas south of the Platte to 25 miles west of Julesburg, very near the, the county line in the Jumbo Reservoir area. And they have 700 to 800 lodges in this. Some, if you use a calculation of eight with about, uh, excuse me, 800 lodges with uh, six to seven people in that, you're easily talking a campsite between the various bands that is well over uh, 5,000 people would have been in this camp with some 1,500 uh, warriors at this point, because now you're having uh, the bands from, uh, that are coming down out of Wyoming, joining up in activities uh, at this time period, preparing for the second raid on Julesburg. And so from this uh, time period on the second, uh, they move that camp, breaks camp, and heads north uh, towards uh, the North Platte River, uh, crossing over Lodgepole Creek and making that move uh, to that area. At the same time, the warriors move again in mass uh, to attack Julesburg. Also, the Bovis Ranch uh, near one of the old crossings on the uh, uh, California and Oregon Trail, uh, moving and attacking that near the Ogallala area. Uh, coming down then, at the main body attacking at Julesburg. Uh, they attempt to uh, have, ruse out the military again, uh, but they're, they're unsuccessful. And so the military uh, stays inside Camp Rankin with the civilians. The Native American bands are able to lay waste to the stage station taking all the goods, this time knowing they're not coming back uh, anytime soon, planning to make their way to the Powder River country in Wyoming. They actually fire the state station, uh, again, trying to draw the military out. They never come out, uh, and then they simply take their loot and head north. Uh, George Bent remarks of this time period uh, that he, he's never saw more goods in a campsites for the uh, Native Americans uh, than he did during this time period uh, in the history of the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, especially. After they burn Julesburg and the campsite has moved north, Colonel Collins actually comes down with some reinforcements, reaches Mud Springs, has a battle with them, holds them off uh, the small party that's attacking him. It's not the full encounter of the 1,500 warriors at the campsite. Uh, after he breaks uh, with that, he heads east following the group that attacked him and engages them at the Battle of Rush Creek, uh, where their campsite is. He comes across the campsite, uh, realizes it's 800 lodges or more, five to 7,000 people, and decides that he doesn't want to be Custer before Custer, and wisely chooses only to stay back and lob artillery uh, towards the camp. The Native Americans in the camp aren't looking for a real engagement either. Uh, they simply start to break camp send out enough of a party to keep him at bay uh, and then cross over the Platte River into the bluffs that are immediately to the north and go into a kind of a no man's land at the time. And Colonel Collins with his 200 or so soldiers uh, wisely chooses not to follow them. And this period of con immediate period of conflict in Colorado and Nebraska then comes to a close and then is resumed in a few months uh, once they make their way to the Powder River country and link up with even larger bands of uh, Lakota. Uh, so turning from there, uh, one piece of my research as really diving into is trying to look through the different uh, 
tribal organizations and the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Sioux, uh, which in this case are the Lakota. Uh, you'll find a mix of the use of the term still even within the different uh, bands and governments of the uh, Lakota on which term they prefer. Uh, generally, I, I will use the term Lakota uh, for that when you're talking about the Teton uh, Sioux or the Teton Lakota um, for that. So they have seven primary uh, bands within their organization. Even then within the Ogallala, I just highlighted that one to show the breakdown. Uh, you have had a lot of infighting uh, in the 1850s that causes splits and new bands to emerge. And so some of those are involved in the fighting, others are not. Uh, so I'm really going through a process of trying to identify those that were involved uh, and those were not through the ethnographic literature. And as I'll, uh, we'll talk a great deal in this, uh, COVID has delayed uh, the tribal consultation uh, that I hope to conduct to talk more with uh, tribal members and uh, tribal historians, as well as the family members of key leaders to try to recreate which bands were actually involved uh, to try to put those individuals back into the story uh, which is one thing as the historian side of me hates is that we have so little understanding of the Native American individuals that are involved in the fight uh, beyond a few key leaders. At the tactical level of war, uh, I highlight this as we turn into that at the lower level, that's really where I'm getting into the pure archaeology, uh, which was a lot more interesting than the history. Uh, the one pro thing about a historical archaeologist is I'm able to draw on all those primary sources to put names and dates uh, to events. I'm not talking about cultures that we can't define or can't say who they were. Uh, we can literally find the descendants on both sides of the uh, hostilities uh, and talk to them about uh, their views on what their family uh, has carried on, those traditions, oral histories on the Native American side at the tribal level, as well as documents uh, written on the uh, military side. One of the real first things I'm trying to do in the archaeological is fix the problem of this shown on here, which is that when you look at most Civil War period battles, regardless of where they're at, uh, you can recreate, even down to the smaller unit levels, a lot of times fairly detailed maps that you'll see uh, at national park sites or through the American Battlefield Trust here that show you what happened over the course of days of the event. We don't have that for Julesburg. Sadly, the report for the 7th Iowa that F Company submitted was only a few paragraphs and didn't contain a lot of detail about what happened uh, during the fight itself. So really the only understanding we have of the Battle of Julesburg itself are the as a map are the map is the map that Bent provided us in his work with George Hyde uh, in the early 1900s, uh, which kind of outlined their movements, even Bent doesn't provide a lot of detail over the specific uh, actions that happened at Julesburg uh, itself. So in recreating that, uh, one of the tactics I've used is looking at a lot through identifying the members of the 7th Iowa Fox Company uh, that were there, F Company, and searching local newspapers for them in Iowa to see if they wrote letters back. It's a technique I used a lot in my uh, thesis on the Powell Expeditions. And in doing so, I find um, so far about 13 or so incident reports of people writing back, a number of them uh, from uh, more senior people, the lieutenants, uh, some of the uh, traders like Jack Morrow, who happened to be at Julesburg at that day, that provide a lot more uh, illumination of what happened in the battle uh, besides the lone report uh, from uh, Captain O'Brien or the later testimony of one of his lieutenants in a uh, holiday's uh, claims case with uh, Jeff and others have brought to light in uh, their work look with the depredation, work with the depredation claims that have happened uh, from this period. Uh, so what the reporting coming together and with those other sources, uh, we know hap what happened. This kind of shows you that far drill down on Northeast Colorado. Northeast Colorado. Uh, initially, uh, the Native Americans attacked a wa uh, stagecoach coming in, the mail coach coming into Julesburg, about four miles east of the station, about five miles from the post. Uh, the post is shown in the green dot, which would have been Camp Rankin. It was built originally in the fall of 1864. In a, the fall of 1865, it becomes Fort Sedgwick from Dances with Wolves. If you'd like to hear the fantasy story on why that was like it was, uh, I can illuminate that later in questions. 
uh, why Kevin Costner did that. Uh, the light blue is where Julesburg Station was. Again, that's the regional uh, hub for the Overland Trail. Two districts use that as their base of operations. The Overland Trail coming to Colorado and through Colorado as well is still the trail that goes up into Wyoming to Fort Laramie. Um, the transcontinental telegraph intersects at Julesburg. The branch line comes to Denver. And then you have the uh, line going up to uh, Laramie and then Fort Laramie going across to Salt Lake and then eventually to California that connects the nation. So the, the mail coach is coming in. They try to attack that. The stage driver keeps racing away, reaches the uh, station, uh, jumps on another horse, goes and tells the fort what happens. Uh, Captain O'Brien's woken up uh, just before dawn. He's like, well, you're at the stage station now. I'm not going out in the dark and finding out what's out there. Uh, so he doesn't send the cavalry out. A few hours later, just at daybreak, uh, another uh, runner comes in and reports that where the yellow dot is at the Conley and Bullens Ranch, uh, there's a wagon train just east of there that's been attacked by another group of Native Americans. Uh, so at this time, O'Brien orders the uh, troopers to their saddle. He has a sizable detachment of his company already gone under Captain uh, Lieutenant Eugene Ware at the time. He wrote the uh, book on the 1864 Indian Wars much later in his life. So his accounts are secondhand. He wasn't at the battle. Uh, but he, uh, the colonel for the 7th Iowa happened to be there that day with a small detachment from another company uh, from uh, the 7th Iowa. So they all go out around 45 soldiers and a few officers head out in three detachments to the east to respond to the, the attacks. On the, uh, the Native American see them coming to the Cheyenne and Lakota and Arapaho that had done the draw and also had run around near the fort even at one point, head off to the east even further. Uh, the cavalry follows them, breaking the three detachments, spreading them out uh, in pursuit. Uh, but unfortunately for the uh, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota, uh, the inability to control the younger braves got them once again. A number of the uh, young warriors came out of the south from the sand hills that are south of I-76 in this region. And the cavalry saw them come out and realized there was more than just the pursuit uh, of the 30 or 40 they were chasing and stopped. And so at this point then about 1,500, 1,000 to 1,500 Cheyenne, Arapaho and Lakota warriors are reported to have come out of the bluffs, literally from the fort all the way down to uh, well east of Conley and Bullen's Ranch. And the cavalry starts to have to fight their way back uh, towards the post. One detachment uh, from what we can piece together, uh, 14 soldiers, including their bugler, uh, I probably advance them. Oops, that's the wagon train being attacked. There's the cavalry coming out. Sorry, I forgot to advance that. Uh, they start to fight their way back uh, through the Native Americans. They're being chased. Uh, 14 uh, soldiers are killed in one encounter uh, where they're surrounded by the uh, onslaught of warriors. The other two uh, continue to fight their way back. Colonel Sooner's detachment uh, pulls up at the Conley and Bullen's ranch, generally, from what we can make of it and proceeds to defend from there, trying to hold off the attackers. He orders uh, Captain O'Brien, the commander of the F Company, to fight his way back to the post and get the artillery. Uh, why they chose not to take one of their tool mountain howitzers with them, we really don't know, uh, but they did not. Uh, so they continue that fight back, eventually making it, and are able to come back uh, with the mountain howitzers, uh, shown in five, uh, to the relief of Colonel Sumner and the others at the Conley, near the Conley and Bullens Ranch uh, in this action. Uh, this The cannons are actually cutouts of the uh, ledger book that was captured at Summit Springs in 1869. And there are a number of events in there that are clearly identifiable as the Battle of Julesburg, uh, based on the uh, two mountain howitzers being used and the death of the bugler and some other events uh, that are noted uh, by the Native American leaders that are shown uh, by different glyphs in that ledger book. So eventually the onslaught continues, the cavalry makes it back. And so the rest of the day, they uh, uh, plunder the uh, stage station uh, at Julesburg. And so what really is happening is from a military perspective, this is not revenge. It's a very complex operation as I've outlined. You have a number of feints and decoy operations 
to try to lure the cavalry out, to draw them four or five miles from their base into a kill zone where you could have just decimated all 45 soldiers had it not been exposed by the early attack uh, by a couple graves. So it's much more than simply a revenge raid that's being conducted here, much more organized uh, between three Native American tribes with multiple bands, multiple leaders uh, taking part. And then they spend the rest of the time taking supplies uh, from the stage station. Uh, so it's a very, uh, and they need those to resupply the Cheyenne and Arapaho that have been decimated at Sand Creek, which is really why this is chosen, I think, is that initial attack is because they want the goods that are in the stage station, warehouses, the cattle that are there, the other things uh, that they can get in this region of Colorado with the least ability for anybody else uh, to interdict them. And back to that previous slide by showing the activities that went on, they had literally forced any sizable amount of troops to Valley Station a good 60 miles away. And uh, on the east, it was past Alkali where you could get any amount of soldiers over 20 or 30 that could respond to this. Uh, so even before they do this, uh, they continue on the attacks. Uh, they, they continue to isolate the area uh, throughout uh, Eastern Colorado. Uh, really uh, looking how I hope to all alliterate, excuse me, illuminate uh, the battle. I, I plan to use a lot of technological methods uh, to do that using a lot of primary sources. Uh, one that I haven't highlighted, uh, you may have heard us talking earlier, creating a period map by taking all the geo uh, government land office maps and re uh, putting them back together uh, on the range and townships so that I can have that geo rectified uh, to show where the terrain was in 1865, where the wagon roads were, the streams as they looked prior to the alterations that's occurred in the last hundred years. Uh, working heavily with the existing maps from private collectors that I can find, as well as some early maps that were made by local residents of the battlefield area, uh, piecing all those together and geo-rectifying them in uh, ArcGIS, and then applying a lot of spatial analysis, uh, view shed, LIDAR analysis, and it shows a couple of those, and I'll show some better examples on a couple slides, and then also bringing in more technology uh, to do drone mapping, high definition of the whole battlefield, uh, but then targeted on high priority areas like the stage station, the fort site, and where we believe the ranch was to do thermal imagery and to do multi-spectral imagery, which hopefully uh, will allow us to identify substances where any of the remains of these structures may still be uh, hidden out of sight. Fortunately, the majority of the area uh, has not been disturbed for agricultural purposes. Most of it has remained ranch land since the battle. Only about half of the uh, fort site has been put under irrigated agriculture. Uh, with the LIDAR, I, I highlight the fort site to kind of show you what I'm doing. Uh, on the slide, you'll see three potential anomalies at where we believe Camp Rankin and Fort Sedgwick were. Uh, it's where local lore puts them. Uh, the anomaly in the center of red are two large berms, uh, which could well replicate to on the right-hand side. You'll see size-wise, and the scale on this is accurate off the blueprints, which could replicate to the remains possibly of adobe uh sod buildings that were off quarters from fort sedgwick uh there are two at the top long rectangular features that lidar shows that you can't see from the surface uh that canal the irrigation ditch that intersects them was put in at the turn of the century uh so obviously whatever made those two features predates that the only thing in the field prior to 1900 was camp Rankin and fort sedgwick so i have a high confidence that those are likely associated with at least some aspect, likely those uh, with the Fort Sedgwick beginning in 1865. And then at the bottom, the most promising, and you'll see it on the right, is the post hospital, the red uh, circle on the bottom, uh, which if you see that L-shaped formation matches very close to the building plan from the National Archives, uh, which is on the left bottom of the slide. The dimensions when you measure that out in ArcGIS are very, very similar. Uh, it talks about it being a few hundred uh, feet to the southeast of the post, and it's on the other side of a wash where disease and other things would be a good place to post, put a post hospital. Uh, so hopefully uh, when we go out in the uh, summer and I'm able to do some work with um, some geophysics such as GPR 
uh, and some other techniques, uh, possibly magnetometry and resistivity, we'll be able to identify that more clearly. And then also to do some targeted coring, hopefully to identify directly where the blueprints show us the fireplaces would have been, uh, which we believe will give us the uh, best indication that we've actually hit a cultural level between six to 12, 18 inches uh, down in the soil. Also on LIDAR, uh, when I talk processing, another step besides the uh, hill shade that you saw on the last one, we can we can take that processing uh, either even further. Uh, this is an example I did for a more of a comparative study of looking at trail remnants. Uh, this is from the east of Julesburg at California Hill, uh, which is on the National Historic Trail for the California and Oregon Trail. Uh, and it's a section where they eventually started going up in Nebraska from the crossing the South Platte. Uh, and they eventually cut through, and you'll see on the right, uh, the black line is where the Park Service draws the National Historic Trail today uh, for recognition. But when you actually drill down and plot it, you can actually see the ruts through the ground very well in the center of that red relief uh, where they've cut through that hillside. Uh, and the LIDAR just really brings that uh, what is even when you go out there today, it's very difficult to see other than the tops of the hills uh, where they've cut through. Uh, but on LIDAR, you can see that for many more kilometers uh, along the California Trail area. Uh, and so LIDAR really will be a powerful tool. So part of my project has been going through the uh, LIDAR from the USGS, looking at other historic trail sites or military sites and developing a comparative database. So when I look at sites uh, that are not 100% known in Colorado, we just know maybe they're in 160 area acre. Uh, that we can have things to compare our analysis against. And again, that's trying to just take these literally thousands of acres that I have of study area just at the Battles of Julesburg, let alone at other parts of the trail to a more manageable size and apply geophysics and some other thing uh, methods at much more specified areas. I just throw this one in here again. It's another example of Fort Union because I think it's really cool. If you've ever been to Fort Union along I-25 in New Mexico, it was the main supply hub for decades for the U.S. military uh, for operations in the Southwest. The upper view is that LIDAR-based, uh, high-processed, uh, three-dimensional analysis through Global Mapper that really can give you an indication of the terrain around an area uh, to see what it looked like when you strip away the trees and other structures uh, today. I actually am planning to build a complete model of the Battle of Julesburg area in a VR world using this LIDAR processing that I'm talking about now. So you'll be able to interact with how it looked in 1865 without the without I-76, without uh, all of the railroad and all the other modifications to the area that have taken place. And so on the right, you'll see the Star Fort, which you can barely see on the bottom left in just the aerial imagery, uh, that when you apply that red relief processing to it, uh, it really just stands out and having been there, uh, you nowhere can see this level of relief when you're standing on the ground. It just looks like a ser series of rolling hills. Uh, but LIDAR will really bring out uh, on these uh, sites uh, the modification of the terrain that has taken place. Also using a lot of view set analysis to try to understand uh, how both sides would have defended and attacked uh, different branches and state station sites. A uh, student working for me last summer on a course for CSU, he actually conducted a view set analysis for about 200 locations, every single ranch and stage station, uh, and how uh, you would see that from high points, from multiple vantage points uh, from each of those locations. And he looked at it from how we could see it if you were in green, as this shows, uh, from a horseback. Yellow shows what you would see if you were standing. Uh, and then prone shows you what you would have seen only if you were laying. Uh, so the green is added if you see all of the red and all the yellow area from the horseback. And then you also see what you what is additive in green to kind of explain how that works. Another way of viewing it over aerial imagery, uh, showing you what you would have seen from Fort Sedgwick. Uh, the slide on the left shows what the Native Americans would have seen uh, looking down on Nebraska Ranch uh, from the high ground. Um, and so I think that'll be very key as I talk that understanding of the tactical fight, replicating that, and then rerunning these view sheds once you take out the modifications of roads and, and reservoirs and other things, I think will provide us a much more accurate understanding of how the tactical commanders, both Native American and American, saw the battlefield at the time. Um, 
remote sensing. I plan to use a lot of the techniques that I've mentioned. Uh, these are some of the things that I think we'll be able to still identify. I'm not necessarily going to look for every single one of these at every single position across uh, the battlefield. Uh, but by using LIDAR, by using drones, I hope to find key target areas, anomalies to apply remote sensing, to apply uh, resistivity and other methods to magnetometry, uh, to locate uh, items that will help us identify where key uh, features were on the battlefield, such as the Colony and Bullens branch, uh, buildings at the stage station, and where it'll really help us if we can identify any of the wells uh, that existed at Camp Rankin and Fort Sedgwick, uh, because those are both documented. Uh, we should then be able to really associate where within that 60, 80 acre site that the buildings were Camp Rankin and uh, Fort Sedgwick uh, based on the uh, archaeological record. Uh, this kind of also just shows what it looks like today in those areas I've mentioned uh, where my research areas. Fortunately, over Christmas break, uh, I was able to get in contact with a landowner that gave me access to uh, the 6,000 acres on the bottom half of the slide where two, three, and four are located. One, two, three, and four are located. Uh, he owns the South Platte River Ranch uh, and he uses it as a conservation area, rents it out, uh, and he is very supportive of archaeology. He's given me permission uh, to really pursue any type of activity that we want on the ranch. And so I think it'll be very uh, uh, fruitful. And it's critical because that's where we believe the battle at Conley and Bullens Ranch would have been. The wagon train would have been attacked, as well as possibly a good portion of the actual battle between the three detachments uh, as they went into the kill zone with the Native Americans. Also important of his land is where number two, uh, after the battle, the uh, 15 military members that were killed, as well as the four civilians that were killed that day, uh, were buried in a mass grave at the Post Cemetery. Uh, so that's one of the areas this spring that we're going to test the geophysics on uh, with Dr. Henry's lab here at CSU, the, the Crag lab, and go out and see what we can determine for magnetometry uh, and possibly GPR, uh, what actually remains. The grave was removed in the early, late 1800s to Fort McPherson National Cemetery. Uh, but local lore reports that there were civilians left, possibly, and half of the bodies were interned as unknowns. Uh, so the records of who was buried and where were not very good at the time. Uh, so there's probably a high probability that at least partial remains are still left. And if you look at many of the other Indian War cemeteries uh, that were relocated at that time period, uh, generally the military would leave civilians that had died along the trail uh, and leave them in place while they would move perhaps spouses and children of the military. They would not move pure civilians uh, with, with that removal uh, process. Uh, I was able uh, initially in 2019 to make sure that this was a viable project, conduct uh, about three and a half weeks of metal detecting with volunteers in the local community, as well as the historic artifact recovery team out of the Eureka uh, Metal Detecting Club in Denver. Uh, we were able to locate many more artifacts than I thought, uh, almost 2,000 in that first iteration. Uh, a couple students and I have gone back, back out since and tried to uh, fill in the gaps where we didn't cover. At the time, a lot of the gaps that you see on here were because of the in invasive plants that had grown up to about three feet. Uh, since then, the farmer has taken them out, so we're able to go back in and fill in areas uh, that we couldn't detect previously. But during that time period, we did about 225 meters by a 250 meter area represented on this slide. And as you can see from that, we really didn't find the extent of the site. Uh, so next time we're going to go back and start out about 200 meters more and work our way back in, hopefully, to determine really the main activity area of the site of the uh, Julesburg Station uh, itself. In that work, there was a number of diagnostic artifacts we found. Some have been found previously, uh, but the most important uh, by other uh, work, uh, research, uh, amateur archaeologists like Dallas Williams, uh, but we found four shell fragments in the work in uh, 2019. What's critical of that, because this reinforces and mandates that O'Brien had to bring the mountain howitzer back out, uh, which is not well illuminated in the reporting. Uh, and exactly where they maneuvered them to. 
uh, by fire, by applying range rings of about 1,200 yards, giving it well beyond what would have been its realistic max range. Uh, you can see where they would have had to fire that cannon from the mountain howitzer to put that fragment anywhere near uh, the stage station site, which is a good uh, half mile to the east of where we believe the fort to have been located. Also, because it's smack in the middle of the stage station uh, with a high level of confidence, I would argue the only time you would lob rounds into the stage station would have been during that day in January 1865, because obviously we wouldn't put the stage station at risk. The second battle, they did not come out of the fort. We know they didn't fire it then. Also, even after the battle, when the stage station isn't rebuilt, uh, you don't have, you still have the telegraph going through the area. So the military would have been very hesitant to fire adjacent to telegraph lines for fear of damaging them uh, and becoming instant uh, uh, fodder for their superiors for taking such actions. They could easily fire to the south where Dallas Williams, who's mentioned on the slide, has found a number of later artillery around fragments uh, from guns that were associated with later activity at Fort Sedgwick. Uh, so again, I think it's highly probable that rounds were fired uh, on January 7th, 1865. Also found a number of cartridges uh, that are to the time period. Most importantly, out of those being the Gallagher carbine rounds. Uh, that is the round that is fired by the 7th Iowa. They were carrying the Gallagher, uh, primarily the Gallagher 50 caliber. It's a horrible weapon uh, because of the design of the shell. As you see on the top, it looks like a, a two liter bottle. Uh, when it warms up, it likes to stick in the bottom of the right in the chamber of the rifle, and there's no rim on it like you have on modern day cartridges, like on the Spencer or the Henry, even back then. So pulling it out of the uh, when it jammed in the weapon uh, was very difficult. So there's tons of uh, misfires, tons of jams uh, from the soldiers when this happens, uh, and so not a great round for them to be using. Uh, one of the challenges uh, I will obviously highlight very quickly is periodization. Uh, there's a lot of similarity between this period of the Civil War in the West, what they are using, and the weapons that are used throughout the life of Fort Sedgwick, and really almost through the 1870s, uh, through uniform styles and, and different pieces of equipment. So there is a lot of overlap, especially in the immediate post-Civil War years. Uh, so when you find a button, it's not simply you can say it's a button from the 7th Iowa, uh, it was from the battle. Uh, the area is heavily utilized by the military, even dating back to the 1830s. Uh, Colonel Dodge's expedition actually camps in the general area of Lodge Pole Creek. Uh, Camp Rankin is actually, uh, Sed Fort Sedgwick is actually named after Major General John Sedgwick of the Civil War. In 1856 and 57, he is the deputy for Colonel Edwin Voss Sumner, who goes on the Cheyenne campaign in 1857. And they actually camp at this area, uh, Colonel Sedgwick's men, when they come down through the area. So there's multiple military activities prior to the battle, as well as heavily afterwards. Fort Sedgwick eventually becomes regimental posts. So you have company after company using it as a base of operations to move into later campaigns uh, against Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota in Wyoming and uh, northern Nebraska. So a lot of problem differentiating that, which is why rounds such as the uh, 50 caliber Gallagher and the rounds of the uh, artillery, I think, are will be so critical in that really splicing things down what are from the time period of the Battle of Julesburg itself. One uh, aspect I'm trying to utilize to do that is XRF, uh, primarily with the lead bullets to analyze those, especially those that are smashed, that are clearly uh, were fired either at game or in fun or in hostility and hit something uh, to try to trace the ammunition uh, signature through XRF uh, and to which identifies, if you're not familiar with it, the elemental composition of the material you're uh, studying used primarily by geologists, but now adapted to the archaeology. So if I have a smashed bullet, I can analyze that against uh, misfired Gallagher rounds and others that have been found. Uh, Gallagher rounds from collections uh, outside of the Battle of Julesburg to associate that lead and see if I can identify it uh, as the same elemental composition as the uh, rounds uh, that are other rounds that I find. Um, had a test of this in January, the CSU uh, geology department 
uh, Earth Science Department has some of the uh, this equipment. Uh, so we're exploring how to use it more effectively. It did have some promising results and give us some differentiation. Uh, now it's going to simply be going through the process of analyzing hundreds of rounds uh, to develop a solid uh, database. Also hope to do that with some of the artillery. The still is not necessarily as effective uh, in doing it, but we hope to try to see if we can do similar associations uh, with that, with other cannonball fragments uh, from the site similar to that one I showed you that was re-pieced back together. Another aspect of the project to uh, wrap it up is to uh, form a digital comparative database. I'm using the Omeka platform. This will be open to the public when we're finished. Uh, they'll have photographs, multiple views, all the uh, measurement data. But one thing I found, there is not a good online database that deals with this uh, material to become familiar to the basic level I have and as I continue to progress. You got to buy about three to four thousand dollars worth of ammunition and equipment books. Uh, so hopefully to develop something and turn it over to perhaps the Society of Historical Archaeologists, so everybody can pull on it and draw from it and benefit uh, from this research. So it just doesn't stay uh, locked up on a computer hard drive that eventually uh, goes bad. Uh, also done a lot of public outreach like this. Continue to hope to do that. I hope to make a series of story maps that'll make the posts and the unit locations. Uh, and facilities. Uh, the one shown here shows all of the military facilities uh, throughout uh, those various departments I mentioned earlier in the 1864-65 time period. And to uh, engage the time feature that's on ArcGIS. So then when you engage with this, you can really see when Fort Hayes, when Fort Wallace, when Fort Sedgwick goes away, when does Sydney Barracks come online because even being heavily involved with this for two years now, and I'm sure others can attest to this, it gets challenging at times to uh, temporally and spatially understand uh, what forts come and go uh, throughout this very dynamic uh, time period. And I hope that will help people uh, do that. Lastly, we do have a Facebook page. Uh, if you're interested, please uh, look it up. It's the Julesburg Project, or you can do at Camp Rankin 1865. On Facebook, I think we're up to about 500 uh, people that are following it. Uh, a big goal of mine, uh, being the public historian side of me, is to find ways to get and share this information, engage the public, uh, so that it doesn't simply reside in my dissertation that my committee may flip through, Jason will read, and then maybe my parents will uh, look at a few pages of. Um, so really to try to find ways to use that more uh, in things uh, throughout the dissertation and just not wait till the end of it and then try to uh, convince the Colorado press to uh, have me rewrite into a different version. So my expected results to wrap up, uh, what I really hope to do from this is to uh, tell that story uh, that I mentioned. I think it's a critical story that needs to be told on the Native American side uh, and to focus on it. As I mentioned, uh, Jeff Broom, Doug Scott has done a lot of work on uh, pieces of it for Doug. Jeff's done a lot of work I'm putting it into the overarching larger context, uh, but I really want to focus on just this battle period uh, in 1865 and highlight it uh, from the view I have of a military uh, officer, archaeologist, and a historian, uh, and hopefully add to that dialogue of what I think has been an overlooked era in general by the historians and archaeological community and ethnographic community over the last uh, century. And with that, closing thoughts. Uh, this is a story, as I said, that should and needs to be told so that all parties can understand our past, how it shaped our present, and allow ourselves to learn fr from it, better shape our collective futures. Uh, I won't read all of this to you, but I think in a large way, too, when I talk the different people that were involved at early ages, if you look at most conflict with Native American tribes of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota over the next 10 to 15 years, almost all of the... Uh, future leaders, uh, whether what we call chiefs, or shirt wearers, or, or war leaders uh, making decisions later on on the battlefield and in tribes are involved, vast majority of them at Julesburg. And I think they get that indication that perhaps they have a chance uh, to change history, to push back against the uh, whites as they've been trying to do for about five or six years, trying to find a way to do that individually. This was their first collective attempt at that. It's their first winter campaign. It's their first major offensive operation in a combined aspect against the US military. 
and definitely their first time where they're really trying to take on sports like Camp Rankin uh, and large groupings of soldiers versus random uh, small groupings that they would throughout Kansas, Nebraska in 1864 and earlier years. Uh, and what they do then through the rest of 1865 is continue on this battle. Uh, so I think it's a very inform informative period that we need to understand and also was very formative on the Native American side, especially. And so it needs to be understood uh, much better than it has been. So I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Should I go to the, oh, are we in the chat? Okay, let me. <laughs> uh, can you guys all hear me? Can somebody give me a thumbs up? We can hear you. Okay. I didn't know if I got a presenter view, if I did anything wrong. Yeah, with, uh, for Tandy, with the Kevin Costner story, uh, one of the advisors that was on the movie uh, told me that when they were filming it, uh, when they were starting out the process, he kept wanting to film in South Dakota. Uh, and so he kept saying they'd come up with ideas about there weren't enough. I think one somebody said was one time it was that there weren't enough Native Americans to help the movie in, in, in Oklahoma. Because uh, actually the story that Dances with Wolves is about is based on a true story, but it's based on the tribes, some of the tribes out of that are in Oklahoma and we're in the Texas Panhandle, Comanche, Apaches and others. It, it's not based on the the plain northern plains central plains the indian so he changed it to uh kind of from the to the lakota and others to fit the story that he wanted to tell and so he kept coming with all there's not enough people that can ride horses again oklahoma probably next to texas the most horse riders you're gonna find eventually it comes out he basically wanted to film apparently the movie on his brother's ranch in south dakota uh and it's like the, the people that were working as the archaeologists, anthropologists and others historians are like well you're writing the checks you can pretty much film wherever you want you could just say that from the get-go you know you don't have to come up with all these other kind of crazy uh stories uh to, to do that uh let's see camp rankin half of camp rankin is plowed unfortunately the northern half uh, of fort sedgwick uh the southern half of what was fort sedgwick has not which from what i'm guessing would mean about two-thirds of camp rankin uh, would have been from where I can plot the Denver would be south. Uh, I, I, to me, from the military perspective, I would have had Camp Rankin. I would have, in eight, when they did the building in 1865, I would have built the new buildings around Camp Rankin and then torn down whatever the old uh, buildings I didn't want uh, just because of size. Uh, and so we think, I, I would generally estimate that Camp Rankin likely would be uh in somewhat the center of where they built fort sedgwick and look at the wells the map we have from a couple of people uh that were at camp rankin as well as the maps of fort sedgwick they generally match up i would assume they didn't drill they may have drilled other wells uh but they still would have used that core well that actually dates to an, a ranch that was built uh where they bought the military bought in 1864 to, to make camp rankin I hey, Ray. Uh, before you keep going on to my questions, uh, we have two folks that raise their hands to ask questions. Oh, okay. Um, Do, are there, Steve and Jeff. Yeah, I'll you let you call on them. Hey, Jeff, go ahead. You're muted. We can't hear you. Yeah, Jeff, you're muted. I can't unmute you.
Hopefully, Jeff. Jo Cheryl, do you want to go ahead while Jeff tries to get back in? I think Steve had one. I'm sorry, mine was by mistake. Oh, no worries. Cheryl, right. do you have a question? Well, Let me see. You're still muted, Jeff. There should be a little button at the bottom that looks like a microphone. If you click that, it should unmute you. Oh, never mind, he left. Well, we can uh, run down the list in the chat while we wait. Yeah, I can jump down. Let's see. Uh, Brittany asked about best references. Um, on the a really good reference uh, is Jeff's book on the Cheyenne Wars. Talks quite a bit about this. Um, another good reference that's easily accessible. Um, there are is the Denver Road by Monahan. Uh, she also has a Fort Sedgwick uh, book on Fort on uh, Fort Sedgwick, and I can uh, send the actual. Uh, references and, and in the case you can send them out if you'd like um as well as then um uh 1865 uh i'm mind blanking on the author at the moment uh they talk about it a lot and then dallas williams uh the fourth said excuse me museum sells that uh most of these books you, uh, if you can't find any of them dallas williams wrote two on fort sedgwick one on the it's uh primary on the, his archaeological work uh, and the second is uh, he did, it was really on just the medical uh, uh, activities at Fort Cedric. So unless you're interested in that side, I just recommend his first one. Can I be heard now? Yes, I can hear you, Jeff. Please go ahead. Oh, I so apologize. I thought I was being heard and then I was talking away and then you said you couldn't hear me. <laughs> so, and then I got disconnected. So I'm sorry. Thank you for uh, mentioning my Cheyenne War and how it's helped you. You have accomplished a tremendous amount of, of research on this, and uh, it really, really looks good. Um, so um, I'm really uh, happy for what you've done. Um, and I, I, uh, I, I'm willing to work with you on any aspect of that that, uh, uh, that you need. Um, I heard of your uh, talk from the uh, Pueblo uh, Archaeological Society, which I'm a member of, and I'm going to try to arrange to maybe bring you down uh, to give a talk to them when it opens up again, and maybe you could stay a guest at my house. Um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I know since we talked, I think we talked uh, when we were out there, July, uh, when, right back when the world was still the world, <laughs> the Summer yeah. Springs commemoration time period and then right uh, that's when i met you yeah yes. we, were, we talked about it and we working and then the world changed on us this last year yes. yeah I'll definitely i'd love to get down and, and talk to you more about the work you did on this, especially on the the sites on the rest of the the trail sites and uh because a lot of what you did in there and others is uh, somebody asked about the historic trails if you use it from a hundred thousand scale map uh it's a great tool but when you drill down for accuracy, that's when Scott's, you know, you're not going to get the resolution. Uh, you're, you're looking at probably a quarter section, a lot of, of what he identifies, which you're talking 160 acres out. Where in this field is something at if, and some of that's still kind of disputed on some of the sites uh, along the trail. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to take other people's uh, questions away from you, but I use the archaeology at Summit Springs to try to find Susanna Alderdice's grave. And in my new book, uh, that's the last chapter um, where I used uh, the reports of uh, Danny Walker, who is the uh, Wyoming state archaeologist, and Doug Scott, who is the premier uh, archaeologist for the military of these Indian wars, and yeah, uh, Doug, summarize their reports. Yeah, Doug has been a, a, a great help. He actually, I, I was using his book the whole time, 1865. Uh, oh, yeah, he, that's uh, good. He, he uses the... Uh, 
he, he Doug Scott is a former uh, Park Service archaeologist, really created conflict archaeology pretty much in the, as a discipline in the world, uh, former head of the Society of Historical Archaeology for two years, uh, did the work at Little Bighorn that really redefined the battle, did the work at Sand Creek to make it a national historic site, started out in the 70s after graduating CU, his dissertation was making Fort Larned in Kansas into a national historic right. site. Just amazing. I, I gave us talk out of nowhere in Burlington uh, about two years ago. Fortunately, I on Zoom, I can see you're here. And your name is there and then we've met before, but I'm giving a talk and I'm like, man, some guy in the audience looks familiar. There's only like 15 people in this library. And at the end, this guy comes up to me and goes, hi, I'm Doug Scott. And <laughs> I about had a heart attack. I'm like, I'm glad you didn't tell me ahead of time. Cause I would have probably pissed my pants. <laughs> I, for he basically uh, has for historical archeology. span He has their Harrington medal, which is the most pronounced uh, profound medal that the society gives. And it's just literally, internationally recognized and uh, on that and he's been a great help he's an advisor uh for me ever since then we sat down and had dinner that night and uh yeah doug has been great uh he actually told me some stories about going out and trying to find the grave uh with it when you and danny have been out there doing doing work yeah it's, that's great any other live questions Uh, Chris, my, my dissertation committee entirely agrees with you, uh, thus the scaling back. And then when I sent them a revised uh, con up, they were like, well, I, it's really good. Thanks. But I still think you'll be here forever. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, I understand the undertaking um, um, to do this. And I, I, I probably will, will complete the dissertation and, and keep working it for years. Much as Jeff mentioned, Danny Walker, who spent about 30 years uh, working at uh, Fort Laramie continually, and uh, still has projects that he'd like to uh, like to do there. So, uh, Jason LaBelle warned me about the dangers. Uh, as you'll see, I'm not trying to dig anything at Fort Sedgwick because if you start digging at a 10-year military fort, you may never leave the site. Uh, just because you know, the amount of <laughs> latrines and wells and other things, pits the military would have. So, uh, avoiding any actual excavations on the military site as much as possible uh versus the battle sites um i'm missing any others i'm trying to skip over katie she and i'll talk lidar and stuff forever on people i do have some non-remote sensing questions if you want to ask you them, but yeah. they're there Can, do you remember them well or? well Brittany, Brittany was asking how off um those like one to one hundred thousand historical maps are and i'm curious well, to see if you're going to do an a uh, an accounting of like how off they actually are from the segments that you identify oh the uh the plat maps the government land survey well maps. yeah i mean yeah it sounds like you actually have a lot of historical map sources yeah i, I mean i literally have a every single uh, i think there's only three or four that were damaged and missing so I have about, right now, I, I have georectified about 4,000 range and township plat maps. So I have basically everything in the, if you're familiar with the government land survey, when they came across and surveyed, uh, I guess with IFCAS, IFCAS, this will make more sense than most people. When you have uh, the uh, the road and, you, and uh, the boundary line for one north and one south runs right through Boulder uh for when they came across into the government survey so everything north of boulder is a one two three for range of township and then you come from the six prime meridian west and it's one uh, and so four column i think i'm in here in Timnith, uh, uh nine north 67 west uh somewhere about that and th those maps are six miles by six miles have the 36 sections on them and so that's what i've been using the overlay from the blm uh that owns those records today they they have the the land grid survey uh geo rectified that you can use in arcgis so using that and geo rectify them mostly to the corners uh initially for some work i tried to do it by the section it just became clear that was it, a was a level of fidelity i probably didn't need and but i can get the i think the sections are pretty close to where they were and when you take the islands, uh, some of the more defined features that still exist on the plat, 
you can see where the the map today or where the uh, six by six mile map when you georectify that uh the island that was on 1872 most of the 1870s for colorado nebraska has a lot of 1860 maps that the islands will actually match up fairly uh succinctly with the uh islands that are still on the blm uh national uh public land survey system overlays that are still used today for the legal definitions so i think in general general they can be fairly good you do get some indications by the amount of information that's on them you can really see the different surveyors that have done things because you'll come to some where they literally just turned in the range and uh sections they didn't fill any terrain features in um fortunately most would hit the streams um it, I hope to go through later on the actual survey notes, which you can find some more information in. Uh, but again, just the scale, as we've mentioned, the scale of the project, that's a, I will only probably go into depth on that survey notes for very specific areas. Like here's the fort, here's the, where I think a ranch house was or something uh, to see what was there. The one challenge with Fort Sedgwick area specifically is that it was a reservate military reservation. So initially they didn't survey it. They just drew the reservation boundaries on the survey. And then they had to come back in 1887 when it was given to the Department of Interior from the Department of War to sell, they had to come back and resurvey it. Um, so I, I, I would say in terms of a guess, I would say in most features are probably within 500. I'd be comfortable saying that most are within three to 500 meters at worst case. And in some, you'll be able to get it down where those features are much more uh accurate um and i found it most useful for identifying streams because the irrigation for agriculture has so changed and altered even streams like beaver creek and kiowa so much irrigation and things have been done to all the courses some of those streams some have been routed into irrigation ditches and then moved into reservoirs uh around the jumbo reservoir so just finding George Bent references they camped three streams west of Julesburg, about 25 miles. Identifying three streams on the modern map is almost impossible. You know, what really were the free streams he was talking about. And so I found it really useful uh, for that. Other questions? Yeah, thanks, Bob. I'll help out uh, Indian Wars anytime that uh, Mike needs, needs some help. I need to re-engage him. He and I actually had a conversation before the last one about uh, we were talking, it would have been this year, but with COVID, obviously, we just bumped last year's events uh, of possibly even doing the Eastern Colorado sites as a uh, as an order of Indian War annual, annual meeting one of these years. Yeah. I think you can ask your question, Chris. All right, I, I, will, I will go ahead and do that, Katie. Uh, so I'm interested in how you're going to tie this whole narrative together, like how you're going to put this into that bigger perspective from this all this granular detail that you're pulling out, because that's a lot of granular detail that you're bringing to this, how you're, how you're gonna try and create a narrative that ties it all together and what you're kind of thinking that narrative is, might look like. Well, really, I think the narrative uh, on the oper strategic, the strategic side will really kind of be a lot of just synthesis of what some other people have said. But I, I think really on the operational level, and that's really one of the hard areas to do on, on a study, for the exact reason you highlighted, do my critique of others' uh, uh, attempts to use the uh, strategic, the levels of war analysis is that to do the strategic and operational is so over bearing the amount of detail and, and things that you have to put into that analysis it, is why it usually gets done at a very cursory level. Um, and so that's the challenge of doing that, which is my committee's biggest fear of this is are those two levels. 
is I think through using some of those military tools, you can incorporate a lot of that information in a more manageable uh, framework that people can understand, like the PEMISI analysis. Uh, when you, when you, it's really just a nodal and that way of doing nodal analysis that shows where all those different pieces of infrastructure and communications lines were. And you can kind of highlight where the, the, the limited amount of choices people had with the tactical capabilities that they have to do anything. And then when you look at what they were trying to accomplish strategically, um, it's, uh, you can kind of see how the, it'll hopefully line up and you can talk how those relate to one another. And I think on the operational level, where we'll be able to see that is showing, like on the U.S. side especially, the economy of force, even within the Department of Kansas, uh, General Curtis just wants Western Nebraska and Colorado to go away. He doesn't want to deal with it. He's worried about the rebels in Kansas and in Missouri, um, which is why Connor gets brought in. And I think when you kind of look at some of the, the operational movement of forces, I think we can on the American side easily paint that picture. Um, and I think my background is a, as a campaign planner would kind of be able to piece that back together perhaps better than has been done in the past. Uh, articulating it is definitely going to be the biggest challenge um, and an easy to understand. I think that's where some of the graphic, graphical tools like our, uh, story maps will uh, come together. Kind of what I'm envisioning is taking that intelligence preparation of the battlefield at the upper tactical levels and the PEMISI and the DIME overlays and making it an arch acid and turn on and off and look at them uh, to accompany a narrative to, to make that more engageable if that kind of speaks to it but but it is by far definitely the the harder part of this and i think turning more just to the camp making the argument of a native american type campaign because if in the military i would look at you you'd look at the action the reaction and then the counter action and then really what i would argue that happens is sand creek for the americans is the action you then get 1865 up to october well really to about uh august as the early September as the Native American reaction. And then you get the final counteraction, which is General Connor's Powder River expedition in late 1865, really starting in late July, where he comes up in and tries to go up into the Powder River. Not really successful, not a dismal failure, but this really doesn't accomplish anything. And I, so I think if you look at from that frame for the Americans, it's definitely really a related time period. And then if you look at it, from the Native American time period, um, it's a, uh, I think a, a series of organized events because as, I didn't talk a lot in here, but if you go into later 1865, these same players keep coming involved and they keep growing the scope of what they're doing, even to the point where, as I said, Red, Red Cloud and others become involved. Uh, the, the army sends the Laramie loafers to Fort Kearney for some asinine reason, they decide that's a good move. They've totally peaceful for about 15 years, and they forcibly try to march them to Fort uh, Kearney in Nebraska, uh, triggering a revolt and getting another company commander from the 7th Iowa killed, uh, and then driving all of the uh, Lakota that they're trying to move up into the uh, Sand Hills again, linking up with uh, more of the uh, Northern Ogallala and other Northern Cheyenne. And that those are then the people that end up fighting the next year in uh, 1866 in the uh, Red Clouds War. So really this is the start of a series of snowballing events uh, that I think hopefully when it's all done and together, hopefully I can piece together in a, in a much more better narrative than I've just uh, illuminated now. It's quite a story to tell. There's a lot of story there. There is. Um, uh, um, I'm is it Monet? I want to say Monet. Uh, there is one author that's attempted to write on 1865, uh, wrote a book about the period, um, which I think does well, but he still does a lot of it's, it's still keeping kind of these individual, individual years, the what, events that happened, and really not arguing that they were more of a succinct, uh, linked series of events, and I, which I think they were, um, especially as the different players, uh, developed. Um, through this. You've definitely made a strong case for this being all linked together as a 
a cohesive narrative. Um, so it, that that part, I think you've clearly done a great job with. It's that it's yeah, it, put, it, 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 putting that narrative as a full and a complete story so that we understand how how it all relates. You've clearly argued that it is related. Now we need to understand how it relates is in my head. Yeah, and I think a lot of that, and that's where I think when you plug the individuals back in more, when you can say that this person was there based on family and bands being so, you know, if you know what band was there, a lot of the people you can start to uh, piece back together who would have been there. You can piece a lot of those, put the individuals back in the Native American side of the story. I think it'll make the making it a unified series of events much, much clearer when you get down, especially below that it was just Red Cloud or Crazy Horse at this period, that period, whether or not it was Spotted Tail was involved, when they different ones broke off. Uh, and I think a lot of that breaking off will also tell a lot of the story uh, when you can see when key leaders were involved and how their views changed and, and uh, morphed during the course of this time period. Any other All questions? Right, do we missed? have any? If there's nothing else, I think we can adjourn. Um, but I want to thank you so much, Ray, for your time and and uh, whatnot, preparing this and talking to us. This is an ambitious project and you've done so much work. This is really cool. Oh, I did have one. Can we go on a field trip when it's safe and stuff? Yeah, no, definitely anytime. I've got a couple other people that have asked. I'd definitely take people out there. Uh, I've gone out twice thinking I was gonna make a video but, and it's usually been like these 60 mile an hour winds lately. And uh, or, or one day I got caught in a snow squall about uh, two miles from the road. <laughs> But yeah, I definitely I would love to take people out. I also have opportunities, hopefully in the summer, for people who want to volunteer. Uh, even if they don't metal detect, people have to, you know, bag, bag and bag and GPS things in. So there might be opportunities for people to do that if they're interested. Yeah. Or even if you're having, um, like, the Geophys folks out. Oh, yeah. And Geophys and drone. Even now, with, I mean, I'll, uh, when I go out to do drone work, I can let people know if they're interested, somebody wants to come out and few hours and see what the drone does and how they do it uh obviously it's outside. i mean we can do it in a fairly safe uh one there's only 1600 people in the county <laughs> but the land nobody's on it would just be us when will this be posted to I, youtube that is the plan when and how can um, that be accessed uh i'll probably do it the weekend after this weekend uh -huh. um i mean i'll i'll post it to our channel which you should check out but we'll also i guess link it on our social media are you on our on the ipcast email list not yet ah yes if you want to sign up then you will know about it thank you yeah, thanks for asking. And I think I normally use Global Mapper for the LIDAR process. Okay. For, and then the Red Relief is what is it? IDP, I think is the, the acronym for the program. Okay. It, it, generates, I, mm -hmm. it generates the sky view, the negative view, the positive view, and a couple. It can do slope and some other colored factors for me. And it'll do them all at once. So I've generally, that's what uh, we've used through, uh, Chris usually uses Fisher. Huh. Is it like optimized to run on like GPUs or something? Uh, I don't know exactly why, because we have to run it. We run it off a hard drive. We don't run it off the desktop. Uh, it is pretty, can be pretty intensive. When it was processing Sedgwick County, I would crash frequently crashed the uh, computer. I had to find, you know, she nearly worked out to figure out just how many tiles I could get away with doing without crashing. Right. Yeah. I, I would be curious to, to look, to learn more about that program. That might, that might be like a separate conversation though. Yeah. I, I, I continue to um, dig out some of the stuff. I, as I was keeping for a while, 
like screenshots of the uh, task manager to see what I was pulling from different. It was GPU intensity, whether it was a uh, uh, processor or whether ran, you know, where was my, where was I crashing? Which I figured out at various times. I simply crashed all three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so part of the reason, like, I use only open source and mainly Python, right, is to like distribute the computing load. Um, otherwise, yeah, I couldn't do what I do. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about programming and Python and all that to, to R to do it. Oh, yeah, R is another thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. OK, are you planning on doing any like temporal data representation like in your in your end products, like in the story maps? I think that I would be pretty to, powerful. Yeah, that's one of the one I really want to do, especially like you said, on the facilities and stuff, because I mean, I've been, yeah tens of thousands of pages I've read about the different forts and different all types looked at them all on LIDAR and where they were and what's there now. And I can't, I get, I mean, I have to look up some of them. exactly when did this, you know, when did Fort Zara in Kansas, you know, when is, and also there's so much bad information out there or inaccurate, I don't know, bads or inaccurate in that. Right. The, you know, there's so much misunderstanding over when things came in, what was what first. Even like on Julesburg, there was a time where there's a in reports there's a Julesburg station post at Julesburg, and really the military is referring to they were camped at the station for a few months, and then they built the post, and so then they changed its name. And like uh, Fort Morgan, when it was a military fort, had four names. So they're trying to figure out why, when, where all those were. They're not necessarily in the right spot. All the probably the exact same spot and. Uh, the military is hard and then you get to the where i really think the temporal would be the most helpful would be the stage and ranches because they're all right now just talked about and you're like they were there but being able to kind of understand better to whatever degree we can when collins and bullens ranch when valley station was there and active and when because uh, you actually get into an, a period of uh stage stations competing where there was a western stage as well as the Pikes Peak stage, the later Pony Express, and then Overland Trail. They were competing in building stations. And then there was even a guy, uh, they even actually tried to build a road from Latham on the north side, use a, a route uh, that didn't get a lot of use, but they were trying to use that in the early 1860s. And so it's really confusing on when and where any of this was. And worse yet, uh, Compass has a number of uh, really blatant errors in it. Like, uh. completely misnamed <laughs> stations and um yeah and so I, i've talked eager to come up with some standardized terminology for this area and i think that's a lot of why the contractor when they did the uh the expansion of the trail system was just like dude this is too much i, I don't want to pull the pin on this this grenade it's all private land to begin with there's no federal land along that trail and that was that was actually their their number one reason for not doing it was like there's no federal land so it's really hard to do this so and with these other reasons let's not touch it um yeah chris do you have another question you look yeah t timeline software sounds like it's a must for you yeah things yeah, that can actually me. visually plot your stuff into a timeline because a, having done a historical-ish PhD, timelines were essential to try and put it all together. Yeah, I actually have it in database format. I haven't worked on putting it into R because I still need to clean it up more. But I took the uh, supplement to the official record, which is another 200 volumes of Civil War documents where they basically took the daily reports and uh, monthly qu quarterly reports and tracked out where all the different elements were. I basically turned all of those for the relevant units in Colorado and Nebraska and a little bit of Kansas into uh, Excel sheet for 1864 or five. Uh, so I can really look at where the locations were, but I, I just got to do a lot more work on figuring how not to crash ArcGIS and when I turn a temporal on that way. Yeah, I, I ended up using Timeline Maker Pro of all the software out there just as a basic timeline maker so that I could organize my thoughts of trying to understand when all the things happened in different places at different times because sometimes 
You'd think there'd be better software out there to make timelines, but really it's hard to make decent timelines and stick all these things in and have it visually that? show up. I used one and it's been a couple of years now. I'm mind blanking on the name of it. It was a digital history product. Um, yeah. That was designed to be a visualization uh, tool for timelines. And I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. I used it in my master's thesis work, but yeah, that, that's always the challenge. It's just how to, put all these together in a in a way to show people that, that jump out the connection oh and, and not only show other people but show yourself so that you're not trying to memorize you know whatever 50 different dates of like okay this this happened here this happened here which one happened first like you have a number of battles there that are all happening within months of each other and trying to understand those connections yeah, that, you kind of need it I said thank god for uh, jeff who's already dropped off but he dug into those uh, into the depredation claims for a couple of his books, and, and that without that, that's where or even the American side, where a lot of the illumination, if there were no soldiers there, if it wasn't for the depredation claims and primarily the work that he did, there was there's very little understanding of what happened, what any of those ranches looked like. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. So, thank you for sharing. No, oh, thank you. Where'd you do your PhD at? University of Southampton in England. Oh, wow. That would be, that would be fun. What was it on? Uh, I was looking at the history of archaeological investigation into the Neolithic of Orkney off the northeast coast of Scotland. <laughs> it's a you little can different, catch a recording like... of his yes, you can watch it on YouTube. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll have to do that. There was also much it. nerding out like there is now. Uh, yes, I have a couple people watching some of your uh, recorded videos for their to credit for my 140 class. Nice. I can't remember which one. I know Sweet. one was on. Uh, I think Mark Mitchell's talk. Somebody asked me about oh. today, but there were a couple others earlier. Oh, what Molander? Yeah, Mark's I thought was Bonnie's awesome. was really cool too. Bonnie's was awesome. Bonnie's and Reed's was really awesome, good. Though. I love Bonnie. Such a yeah. Fan she's girl. on the board now with us at CCPA. She sure is. Yeah. yeah, I'm also the weird one who now lives in Ontario, so I have a whole other <laughs> side of things that I deal with now. Yeah. Cur currently, I'm working dealing Fun, with you know huh? th the historic stuff in Ottawa and the capital of Canada is what my research for my job is currently. You have to swing out, keep going east, go to Newfoundland, you can go hang out at Oak Island. Yeah. Archaeology, you end up in all kinds of different places. Hey, you gotta go where the where the money is if you want to eat. <laughs> I started exactly. the undergrads. I was like, hey, there's lots of work as long as you're willing to move. If you fixate on living in the spot, you might have problems. It's like yeah, at least until you get some serious experience and kind of expertise yeah. that, that that then places will be like, Oh yes, please move here and work with us but that doesn't happen until you're yeah, much further happen. along in your career 20 years on and then you can start those conversations exactly okay i see you still on did you have a question i'm still on too but i'm just hanging out okay <laughs> <laughs> right or die Brittany. Speaking of which, Ray, we're going to have to get together and talk about some of the archaeology of the area. I've only been here for like I going on four or five months in this new house, so I'm unfamiliar kind of with my area. Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, I'll, um, for it's going to be it'll be co-sponsored by the Colorado chapter because we haven't done anything for COVID for about a year. Um, but uh, next month in April, uh, Jason's going to give a talk, uh, LaBelle, on... Uh, Primarily, probably on Lindemeyer, but I'm sure it'll cover some more of archaeology in, in just the general area. Um, Great. Yeah, he and I got to fix the date. It'll be the latter half of April, um, probably on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night, and uh, um, which I'll make sure we deconflict with you guys. Um, yeah. Well, if either of you guys need help with either of those sites or your projects, I am really down to get my hands dirty. So just let me know. Okay. Yeah. Like when I get, um, I was hoping to get out later in March with the drone, but I think the, this weekend's gonna, cause even Julie yeah. to get like six inches. So it'll be the April, I think before there's land, the land is uncovered enough to probably 
and dry enough to want to go uh, walk around out there. But I'll let you know when we plan your own missions and, and other stuff uh, in the coming months. Okay, yeah, let me know. I'm I'm just around the corner. Okay, definitely. It, it looks like uh, Kay actually did have a question in there on the chat. She's just soaking it in. <laughs> yep. Also, are you planning on putting all of this into a book once you've followed out all the storylines as far as you can? Uh, yes, probably at least one, if not two. Uh, actually, one of my conversations with my dissertation committee was you know, uh, is one of the problems, obviously, with dissertations. How do you, how can we make them more easily trans? How do you, how can we write them better? Not a critique of me, just in general. You know, how do you, how can you write it the first go round more towards a selling it to the public so you're not like doing a dissertation and here's 300 pages now here use 50 pages of that and now write another 250 pages you know how to make that a more uh they, they asked me that question for a while i was like well i don't know how about you know and they're like no that's what we asked you well i was like well you guys tell me what to write so uh how would you just tell me to write a book and then i'll make it a lot easier they, they weren't ready for that leap of leap yet but no uh one of my committee members is that is the head of the uh, is on the board for the Colorado uh, University Press and uh, Jared Orsi is a historian and and so we've talked a lot about it, how he thinks is and Mary Van Buren's very she's always thought it was a great story to tell to the public of how to do how to do that um, and, and try to incorporate as much of that in the writing of the dissertation to make it easier uh, to do and that's kind of also when that slide I showed. Him, cutting out some of the military jargon. Uh, it'll still be used in format, but really just focusing on one type of military technique at each level so that you don't gloss over everybody in not only archaeology, anthropology, ethnography talk, but the military talk on top of it. So I have yet to sort that out. That That is a whole other challenge in there. Yeah, I was like, well, I don't know. You, you, tell me what you want me to write. I'll write a book and call it a dissertation. I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at like a book and then like, yeah, I don't know, six or eight different articles to go at it. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, Jason jokes with me. He's like, so when are you just going to move to Julesburg? Cause you could never leave there if you wanted and probably stay employed between grants, writing and everything for decades. Kind of like you said, Denny's done it. Danny Walker's done it for Laramie. Yeah. 